Hi, now let's talk about oolong. Um, so oolong is a huge category. Um, depends on how the tea is made. Some of the lightest teas can be oolong and some of the boldest, darkest teas can be oolong as well. However, no matter what kind of oolong it is, they're all very, very aromatic. There's no other category of tea as aromatic as oolong. They're also all floral and traditional oolongs are all roasted as well. So they typically have that uh, more robust roasted note uh, to the tea, even though there's some newer style of oolong that's unroasted. But regardless, all floral, or aromatic. The oolong that we're gonna use for demonstration today is a style of oolong. Technically, it's called Mingdei oolong, and uh, it's more commonly known as Wi Yan Cha. Uh, so Wi speaks to the location where this tea comes from, which is Wi Shen, and Yan Cha can be translated to rock tea or um, uh, cliff tea. Uh, you get the idea, it's a very cliffy area. Uh, oolongs are typically made using leaves only, so that's why you see this larger earth. And because it's roasted and it has some oxidation as well, so that's why it usually has a very dark appearance. It's very important that we use boiling water to brew oolong, especially for a good oolong. In general, the brewing principle is that you want to use lighter, uh, sorry, you want to use uh, cooler temperature water to brew the more inferior tea to dilute the flaws so the tea becomes less bitter. However, you want to use higher temperature to brew the better teas and this is how you are able to bring the full complexity out of this tea. Let's smell the lid. Oh my god, this tea is so floral. Um, it also have a very prominent kind of savory note. I would say this is almost like a salted flour um, and maybe like, yeah, it's like a baked salted flour. Imagine that. Um, oodles are typically made using single cultivar. And that's why uh, if you want to know more about cultivars of tea, then oolong will be a category of tea you do not want to miss. Um, and also because oolongs are so aromatic, so it gives you an additional aspect to really focus on knowing what are the characteristics for a particular cultivar. The cultivar that we're having today is a very aromatic cultivar called Xilan. So not oolongs are very fragrant, and this is a super fragrant cultivar as well. Uh, so that's why it's it has such amazing aroma. When oolong is being brewed in a room, it really kind of bullets all the uh, other teas in terms of how strong it smells. Okay. So when we brew tea using a gaiwan, traditionally we don't drink the first brew. Uh, again, this is not to uh, clean the tea, so it's not for hygiene purposes. However, um, this practice does start with oolong because the tea leaves are more mature and it's tightly rolled. So the first brew of the tea usually doesn't have uh, a lot of notes to give yet. And we do not want to give this diluted brew to our guests. It'll be rude. And that's why we usually do not drink it. It's really for waking up the tea leaves. So the next brews, the tea can give us a better taste. However, I always encourage everyone to drink the rinse brew if you want to know what the tea has been through post the production of the tea, if the tea is clean, um, a good rinse brew should really just have an amazing aroma, definitely lack of depth, and that's why it's considered diluted. Uh, but it should taste really, really clean. It does not need to have any uh, foreign notes at all. Mm. Very, very nice. And if the tea... Um, is a uh, more uh, astringent tea. The first brew can be very pleasant for those people who uh, have a strong aversion for bitterness and tannic feelings because uh, the rinse brew usually does not have any of those. However, um, in order to not completely waste the rinse brew, we can also give it to our dear tea pet here. So today with me is Jiu Jiu. Um, Jiu Jiu is a, uh, I guess, a more of a cartoon version of a classic Chinese mythical animal that we often use for uh, making tea pet is this three leg golden coin toad. It's basically a toad with three legs and usually with a gold coin in its mouth. 
So now let's meet through the first bird. And you notice that the tea should have a lot more depth and the complexity in comparison to the rinse bird. The standard brewing size for a cup of tea is 8.33 grams. Um, we usually just use 8 grams. When you use a full size, and the size of the guy one is about 110 milliliter, you don't need to brew the tea for very long. And this is the essence of this brewing style where we basically flash brew the tea. Mm. So now, in addition to just aroma, there are a lot of floral notes in the taste as well. It also has some kind of the metallic feeling, almost like minerality in the tea. And this tells me that this tea comes from a really awesome towar. Well, I already know that this tea comes from what we call a true cleft region. So now let's talk about the towar of cleft tea. I would say where cliff tea comes from, uh, which is Wishan, is now probably China's most mature tea region. Um, it has so many already uh, known standards and hierarchies um, and, and uh, systems around it. Uh, when you go there, it's very comparable to certain wine regions in France. And uh, Wishan, is actually a place to worth going even if you're not going there for tea. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site for both its natural scenery and its cultural heritage. It's an amazing location. There are many, many temples within Wishan. However, all the residents of Wishan actually all moved out uh, since it's got its uh, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site um, uh, designation. So, however, the villagers that used to live in Wishan, they still own all the lands of Wishan. And the, all the teas that come from the scenic area is a tea region that we call the True Cliff region. And then beyond that, but the region surrounding it is called the Half Cliff region. There's a part of the Half Cliff region, so technically it's also Half Cliff, however, it's very high in elevation and the tea has its own unique profile and that is a third region that we call the high mountain region. So you can consider the half cliff, the high mountain region and of course the true cliff region that all together make up what we call the uh, true origin or the historic tawar of a wuyi yan cha. Now, um, many people in the local, they actually would joke, how do you tell if the tea comes from True Cliff or not? Or, or how do you know if you're in the True Cliff region or not? Uh, current destination, just keep in mind, it is an evolving definition, but the current definition definitely defines it within the scenic area. So basically, if you had to pay a uh, ticket price to go into the UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site, you're in the True Cliff region. And the True Cliff region is marked the by its signature landscape. Uh, it has a lot of sandstone, it's very cliffy. Um, I would say uh, like a lot of dirt is very rare, so you see a lot of exposed rocks and that's what makes it such a, a, a breathtaking view for the visitors. But also this is why the land produce uh, such awesome tea. It gives tea a lot of minerality in its note. In fact, the mantra for cliff tea is rock bone and floral nose. So floral nose is very easy to understand. And the rock bone is really referring to the unique tannins that's from the cliff tea. So while the tannins is kind of like this tiny sensation, but also it can for a cliff tea, if you feel like it's almost like a little bit gritty, but not too gritty because you do not want the tannins to feel coarse, um, it just feels like a really, really awesome spring water, a lot of minerality in the notes. Um, and then with that, it leaves your palate feels uh, sweet, but also in a very refreshing way as well. So um, within the, uh, there are many different ways you can make oolong. So it depends on how you make the oolong. You can have the tea uh, that's lightly fermented, not roasted, or you can have a tea that's heavily fermented, mediumly roasted. For a cup of tea, uh, we would usually, if we have to put it in one sentence, we'll say that this is a mediumly fermented but heavily roasted tea. 
Um, so I already talked about how when we pick the cliff tea, you want to pick only leaves. And this goes with all oolongs. However, with cliff tea, uh, we actually pick on the more mature side. So once the top butt of the tea tree also open up and become a leaf, uh, this the uh, technical term we call open face and depends on how much the open face is you can have a small open face medium open face and large open face so cliff tea picks about medium to large open face and once the tea uh, has that you actually want to pick a very very long stem and usually have a four or more pieces of leaves on this one stem uh, the stem is very necessary to help regulate the moisture level within the tea leaves during the making of the tea. So after we pick the tea, uh, because the region, no one actually lives in the tea region anymore other than um, uh, people of uh, religious um, groups. And then so uh, the farmers, they actually have to hire porters that they need to hand carry all the tea leaves on these rocks and carry out of Wishan. It's quite a scene. And after we got the tea leaves out, we need to spread the tea leaves and sun dry the, sorry, not sun dry, but sun wilt the tea a little bit. And this is, um, helps to increase the concentration uh, level of the enzyme. So we decrease the moisture and the enzymes become more active and it helps to kickstart a fermentation step that is very essential for making oolong. And after the tea leaves feel soft, we're actually gonna move the tea from outside to inside and let the tea to continue wilt under shade uh, for a few more hours. And now this is uh, usually around right after dinner time, we'll start to shake the tea. So shaking is a unique making technique that we have in making oolong. Depends on the different style of oolong, this kind of varies as well. But regardless, what we do is a step where we kind of disturb the tea leaves physically and it literally helps to bounce water from the stems into the leaves so as the tea leaves feel like it's very much wilted and almost like a dead and then if you do this step it'll become lightly again in this process uh some of the uh undesired aroma will actually uh, leave the tea leaves as well and this is why making tea is so fascinating because it might look like a lot of inaction but actually all of our senses are super heightened because you have to use your eyes use your ears uh, you know to hear the sound of the tea beating the uh, the tea tray and then to use our hand to feel how soft the tea touches and there's a slight difference in the level of greenness in the tea leaves as well and of course using our nose to detect all these um, different aromatic compounds leaving the tea and we do this repeatedly so I'm using cliff tea as an example um, you want to shake the tea uh, about every 45 minutes to an hour and you probably do this six to seven times a night and uh, by the time you finish it's already 3 4 a.m. and that's usually the time where tea makers go take a nap and about 7 a.m. you want to get up and apply very high heat to the tea leaves this is where you destroy the enzymes and stop the tea at this permit at this optimal fermentation level that you have decide decided that this is good for the tea and then while the tea is still soft and malleable we're gonna roll the tea and when we roll the tea using this motion the tea will actually first become a strong shape before it balls up and uh, that's why cliff tea or uh, most oolongs will have a string shape and after that the tea is then dried um, traditional teas usually are dried twice because we want to make sure the tea is dried thoroughly and the first time it wouldn't uh, do the job. So we dry the tea and then we let it rest and then we dry the tea again. And after that, the sorting process happens. So for uh, oolong, because we actually had to pick a lot more than we desire in the final tea, such as mature tea leaves and the long stem. And these all need to be hand picked out during the sorting process. It's a quite tedious step and it takes all summer to finish. Um, and after that, we are really into early autumn time and that's when the roasting starts. So the 
tea that's already free of the stems and the yellow leaves are then being charcoal roasted. These uh, built-in charcoal pits, so each tea maker's household will have this built-in charcoal pit uh, where they burn the charcoal and return them all to the way to ash. And this ash is packed with heat for 10 to 15 days. So it's a very packed, just like ash pit. And then we put the tea on the bamboo tray and put it over this very, very dim light, uh, dim heat uh, of charcoal ash. And we roast the tea uh, for about eight to 12 hours. It really depends on the weather and also depends on the cold of our tea that we're roasting because that subtle difference in the, uh, uh, the thickness of the tea leaves actually doesn't make a difference of our roasting time and the roasting technique that we're going to go about. And um, after the tea is roasted, the tea needs to rest for about three weeks before it can be roasted again. All traditional oolongs should be roasted at least twice. Um, some of the thicker leaf cultivars need to be roasted even three times. And if you have very dry season where you're not really able to uh, roast the tea for too long at a time, you actually have to you know, do this in a more fragmented time. And remember three weeks waiting time between each roasting. So you can actually looking at four, five, even six times of roasting. And this really helps to push out the timeline of when the tea will face the market. This is also why oolong are usually the last teas that faces the market. Uh, this is also a trick to be able to tell if you want to know your tea is a true cleft tea or not. Here, I'm not saying you have to get a true cleft tea, right? Um, it's a different between champagne versus sparkling wine. Pick what you like to drink and you feel comfortable to drink. However, for the true cliff tea, the harvesting season is uh, early May, but the final tea actually does not come out until moon festival time in China, which is lunar calendar August 15th, that usually falls into um, uh, September or October uh, in the Gregorian calendar. And uh, another deadline that people are trying to hit is the uh, deadline of the tea competition every year in uh, November. I would say that's where some of the best teas come out. Um, so it's a very, very long schedule of finding the tea. And remember, um, the finding steps are done on dry leaves. So if uh, any small mistakes, you can actually burn the tea and cause a smoky note in tea, which is distinctly different from the roastiness uh, note of the tea. And you can completely ruin the whole batch of tea and forgo all the initial works that we have done onto the tea leaves. Uh, depends on how the oolongs are made. You can, some of the other typical styles, you can have a light fermented and unroasted oolong, which is very grassy and floral. Uh, sometimes people just call that the taeguanyin style. The more traditional style of taeguanyin would also be medium to heavily uh, fermented and uh, very lightly roasted. Another very floral, fruity, botanic oolong uh, would be a dantong. Uh, it's very, very popular and it definitely has a wine-like mouthfeel from its tannins. And these styles of oolongs are heavily fermented and mediumly roasted. So uh, definitely, uh, if you're just getting into oolong, explore all these options. Oolongs makes excellent, excellent cold brew. Um, especially if you have a strong aversion for bitterness, which is some of the oolongs do have. Um, you can use this whole uh, batch that we use for the hot tea, which is eight grams. Depends on the oolong, sometimes it's seven grams, sometimes eight grams. For clip tea, it is eight grams. And put it in the wine bottle size bottle, which is about 750 milliliter, and let it brew for two nights. So about 40 to 48 hours, and then you're gonna have amazing aromatic wine-like tea.